not only did he have a relationship with the government, but he had a mole in the FBI. In this world, you look out for number one. If you, if any people, take that oath to the grave. These guys are on the street, so they're involved in, in hustling. Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato with my co-host, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And our producer, Signore Roberto Boschain. Uh, we're super excited to have George Christie as our guest today. George is the true embodiment of a rebel with a cause. George served in the United States Navy, but by the 1970s, he was a full-patched member of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Chapter, Motorcycle Club in Ventura, California. He became a charismatic leader of the club and, and probably the only, I think not probably, he was the only OG I can think of to actually carry the Olympic torch during the 1984 Olympics. He's led a fascinating life. George is a friend to some counterculture icons that we will talk about. George himself is George, iconic. <laughs> George, that's right. And I just to let the audience understand that, you know, at, at, at George's peak, um, he was without question one of the top, let's say, two, three biker gang powers in the whole world. I mean, there yeah. weren't many people in that space that held as much sway, had as much respect, uh, and were, were as much of a pioneer as as, as George Christie. Yeah, he's, he's a big deal where he rubbed elbows with some well-known underworld figures, so we'll also, also ask him about that. And because he was so high profile and charismatic, that meant he also drew the attention of local, state, and federal law enforcement so we'll ask him about some of his legendary battles with the state. And then finally, we'll talk to George about his interesting life today, his books, his TV projects, his social activism, it's one which is show. interesting. So thank you for joining us, George. We're happy to have you on the OG podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the stellar uh, introduction. <laughs> that, no, you deserve it. A luminary like well, you, yourself you guys, is always welcome here in the <laughs> Original Gangsters podcast. Well, you guys were talking about me, right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. I think we right, we have the right guy. A true OG luminary. So to start off, George, could you, you need to talk to us? Uh, tell us, tell our listeners, what was it like in the 1970s to to be one of uh, you know the earliest members of uh, this really important chapter, Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I I hung out uh, with a fellow named Danny Brooker in high school we were buddies and his father owned a movie car rental uh, business and he rented the cars to the movies and ultimately he wound up owning movie land cars of the stars it was just maybe a mile from knott's berry farm and uh Peter Fonda's uh, bike was in it. Uh, you know, all these famous cars from these different movies, all the untouchable cars, the Bonnie and Clyde car, uh, the one that got shot up in. But after school, we would go out to Somas, just outside of Camarillo, and we'd hang out on, at the ranch. And at the ranch was a fellow named Dick Woods, who was way ahead of his time. And he was the maintenance guy for the movie land cars of the stars. And he also started the question mark, uh, motorcycle club that, uh, was became a one percenter club endorsed by the hell's angels and the Satan slaves. And that's where I got my introduction. Now I, I didn't go in the Navy. I went in the Marines. Oh, I'm, I apologize. And, uh, Sorry. That's okay. That. No, that's fine. Uh, and I, when I came back, uh, I got in some trouble in the Marines, uh, I was having a problem with uh, taking orders from people I didn't respect. Uh, imagine that, an <laughs> authority problem. Uh, so I got offered a job uh, at the Department of Defense. They, you know, I was scoring real high on uh, everything. I was doing real good. I just was having trouble taking orders from some of the people. So I went to work for the Department of Defense, and I started hanging out with the question marks more and more. They drug me down to San Fernando Valley. We rode down there and I started hanging out with the Satan slaves. And then ultimately this, the Satan slaves took me up to Kern river. That was a big run uh, in the sixties in the uh, early seventies. And the hell's angels showed up there from Los Angeles. And there was one guy in particular, old man, John, who was kind of a legend back then. He was old back then. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, 
and he was your typical looking old school biker, you know, big gray beard, uh, big guy, six, four hands look like baseball gloves. And he just basically took me under his wing. You know, he invited me to come to the uh, clubhouse in Glendale. That was Los Angeles. And I went down there and, you know, within a few months, uh, I became a member and uh, he mentored me and he actually turned the Hells Angels Los Angeles charter over to me uh, right in the midst of that uh, battle with the Mongols. You know, we were in the whole dynamics of the outlaw bike world changed uh, uh, that one summer in uh, 1977. Was that? Uh, oh, it's 70s. This is way after Altamont. Yes. Now, were any yeah, of those it, any of those guys that you knew involved in that? Oh yeah, uh, Paul Hibbets. His name was Animal. Uh, Animal hung out at the ranch uh, with the rest of the question marks, uh, and he got in trouble in probably 1966 at school. Uh, had a problem with the teacher. He threatened one of the teachers, and the cops showed up. He drove out the window, and he actually ran off and joined the Hells Angels and uh, wound up in the Bay Area. And uh, he was the guy at Altamont that was running around with the fox head hat on. I don't know if you recall that guy. And he's the guy that knocked out um, Marty Ballon from oh, the right. uh, Jefferson Airport. That's a famous, that's oh, wow. a very, that is such uh, a famous, that's a famous, clip, famous uh, right. episode from, uh, from, from, from the Altamont Yeah, culture. didn't he use like a pool cue or something? No, he actually, you know, Animal was uh, a pretty rugged character, and him and Marty were friends. And Marty was really upset because the Hells Angels were uh, one of the guys was he was working over some of the people with a pool cue because we were trying to push the people back from the stage. They were pushing the bikes over. They were leaning on them, and the bikes were falling over. It was just complete chaos. So Marty said he wasn't going to perform. So the one of the, I don't know if it was Sonny or one of the other leaders said, go talk to Marty, get him to, you know, start up again. And, you know, Animal went up and said, hey, Marty, come on, man. You know, it's just a misunderstanding. And Marty Ballin uh, started cursing at him. And Animal said, hey, look, we're <laughs> friends, but we're not that good of friends. <laughs> yeah, he seemed like kind of a hothead, Marty Ballin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he actually, you know, he told uh, uh, Animal, uh, to get fucked and animal said hey <laughs> you need to take that back <laughs> and uh and marty Ballin said fuck you fuck you and on the mm. just about to get the third fuck you out <laughs> animal knocked him out and then you know grace slicks gets on the uh, microphone and said well you can thank the hell's angels yeah for and some of that was caught that? on tape. Right. All of it. Yeah. The whole right. damn thing was caught <laughs> and then on the right. murder was yeah. caught on uh, right. the stabbing of that uh At the concert goer yeah, Alan Pizarro stabbed uh, Meredith Hunter. Meredith Hunter was pointing a gun at the stage. Right. And I'll tell you, if that tape uh, hadn't existed, Alan probably would have got found guilty. But they played the uh, raw footage in the uh, trial, and uh, ultimately Alan was found not guilty, like a justifiable homicide. And uh, But that started a uh, problem between the Hells Angels and the uh, Rolling Stones that lasted a decade. Uh, they were supposed to pay for all legal fees, and Jagger did not want to pay the legal fees. They were $50,000, which probably was pocket change to those guys, <laughs> even back then. And he was just being stubborn. He said, I'm not going to pay you guys. And uh, he actually sent a professional security guy down to Third Street uh, in New York, uh, you know, the famous Hells Angels clubhouse in New York, and uh, basically said, you guys need to back off. The Stones aren't paying you. And he lifted his shirt like an idiot, <laughs> and the butt of a gun was showing. <laughs> and, of course, the guys on Third Street uh, took the gun away from him, hit him over the head with it, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, sent him off the street. And then... About a month or two, I'm not quite sure the dynamics of the time, uh, everybody got fed up, and they sent a team out in a raft to blow uh, Jagger's yacht up. It was in the New York Harbor. And uh, 
one of the guys in the boat, uh, Butch Crowdy, his name is Clarence Crowdy, uh, became an informant, and he told the police that, and the police told the Stones that, and we had a check for $50,000 uh, within a few days. <laughs> that's gangster. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> story. Thank you for and just to, that. That's great. <laughs> and George, just to give uh, the audience um, some some understanding of some of the names you were throwing out there, uh, one of the names you threw out there was Sonny, and he's referencing, just for the, the audience that, that doesn't know the history of the Hell's Angels, uh, Ralph Sonny Barger was the uh, original godfather, the founder uh, of the Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club, and a lot of people kind of uh, trace the roots to kind of modern-day motor like mo- a lot of people trace the roots to modern day motorcycle culture uh, to to kind of Barger's vision. Well, he's certainly an icon. I mean, you know, he uh, taught me a lot of things. Uh, you know, him and I are at odds now, but you know, there was a period where, you know, I would go to the Bay Area. I'd stay at his house. When he came to Southern California, he stayed at my house. Uh, he's he's an icon. You can't take that away from him. Uh, in the mid '80s, we started uh, politically establishing uh, uh, different goals for the club, and uh, it's it's an interesting story. What happened was I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, Sonny lost his uh, uh, vocal cords in a uh, can- bout with cancer, and they took out his larynx. He couldn't talk. Uh, they stuck in a, like a voice box or something, and. He decided he wanted to turn the leadership of the club over. Uh, and in the Bay Area, he picked Irish O'Farrell. And in Southern California, he picked me. And, he, you know, Sonny was kind of kind of split the leadership uh, for whatever reason. And a few years went by, and, you know, I started getting uh, uh, and doing a lot of the media and the press stuff, and Irish was doing it up north. And, uh, Sonny realized he wasn't going to die. <laughs> and he kind of wanted his power back. But, Some of the spotlight, you know, I'm he, guessing, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, he had a big ego. I mean, we all had big egos. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's different than a criminal like organization like the mob that, you know, they don't want any publicity and whatnot. We can't help garnering publicity because we're out there with our patches on every day uh, visible we're easy targets and i think that's why a lot of law enforcement uh, like the atf and other uh, uh federal uh agencies started focusing on us because we were very very easy to investigate uh all you had to do was get in your car and start taking pictures you know we're riding all over town with our patches on and whatnot but so once you relinquish your power as a leader, it's very difficult sometimes to get it back because what happens is you're sending a mixed message to the general membership. And that is, you know, I've got a new guy here. I want you to listen to him. So when you try to retake that power, it becomes a real struggle. And I know in the uh, Bay Area, Irish wound up getting murdered uh, in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and, you know, it was a real suspicious type deal, but, uh, you know, nobody was ever prosecuted. So, you know, Sonny and I were great friends at one time, and then, you know, we became uh, uh, at odds politically with each other. Uh, you know, like I said, different visions. But uh, initially, uh, everybody was kind of following him, as you said. He was a real icon, and he was a real... Uh, uh, pioneer in the whole outlaw bike uh, culture. Just to give a little context real quick, uh, Michael Irish O'Farrell was murdered in the summer of 1989. Okay, I couldn't remember when it was, yeah. Uh, uh, it was very suspicious circumstances. and uh, Let, Let's talk about that time during the 80s when, when maybe things were more uh, friendly between the factions. And w- one of the my favorite stories... Um, from your life is is the the 1984 Olympics story, and so uh, if you could give us some background on how the, the the motorcycle club was, you were you were involved in some social activism, giving back to the community, and your adversaries in the state and <laughs> the district attorney they didn't like that, and then um, 
then you get involved in the Olympics, and it's even more, um, you know, uh, controversial. Yeah, even more. So, c- can you can you walk us through that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In 1984, the Olympics were uh, coming to Los Angeles. Some of the events were going to take place at Lake Casitas, the water events, the water events specifically. And the ATF uh, came to town. Uh, it was a squad out of Akron, Ohio, and they came to town and they had security uh, for the lake and surrounding areas. One, what they didn't understand was we had a unique relationship in Ventura. I had made a point to integrate ourselves in the community, like you said, with doing social things and giving to charities and whatnot. And I had made a lot of friends uh, with the businessmen. And when the ATF came to town, they went on this character assassination campaign, and they were showing uh, business uh, leaders in town and private businesses uh, uh, pictures of murdered bodies, uh, talking about we need to watch these guys real close. They're probably going to try to supply weapons to terrorists. I started getting phone calls from the local merchants saying, hey, these guys are down here talking crazy. And I thought uh, we had to get out in front of this. And, you know, what I did was, uh, along with a member from San Fernando Valley named Tiny, uh, we decided that we would get involved in the Olympic torch relay. And uh, for $3,000, you could make a donation and you could participate. And uh, that's what we did. We donated the money. Uh, and then waited uh, for the Olympic uh, Torch Relay Committee to uh, accept our donation so we could actually carry the torch for one kilometer. Now, what I did was I filled out the paperwork, and it's I listed it as our business or corporation, H-A-M-C-U-S, Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, United States. So the acronym was HAMCUS, and they didn't know who in the hell HAMCUS was. <laughs> So I thought that I'd learn how to use the media. I've been watching uh, how the police were using it against us, and I was trying to turn the tide and turn the table a little bit. I had a friend that was a reporter in the L.A. Times, and I went to her, and uh, she went to the uh, Olympic Torch Relay Committee and said, are you going to accept uh, Hamkus as a participant? And they said, well, of course, why wouldn't we? And she goes, well, because it's the Hells Angels. And then it turned into a big controversy, and ultimately they decided they had to uh, uh, let us uh, carry the torch, and it just turned into this huge uh, media coup for the Hells Angels. You know, we became uh, not only uh, participants, uh, uh, you know, but sponsors of the Olympics. And that footage, I mean, when you're when you're running. With the torch, I mean, everyone's cheering you guys on. Tell us about how did <laughs> law enforcement react to that? I mean, what? I mean, that must have really burned their. Um... Well, yeah, they were not happy about that. In fact, I had the liaison to the Ventura Hell's Angels was a, a police officer named Sergeant Handy, who him and I were, you know, we were we became friends over you know twenty years. You become friends with a guy, even. Uh, uh, you know, he could be on a different team. And, you know, he never said anything to me uh, or asked me any compromising questions. I never asked him any. So we developed this mutual respect. And he came to me and said, George, these guys are mad. You've got to lay off the media attention. And uh, I sent a message back, you know, through him. I said, well, you guys wanted to play hardball, so we're playing hardball. And I wasn't about to let up because – it was all coming in our favor. You know, it was all positive uh, stuff for us, positive input from the community. And, you know, on a, not just a national level, it became an international level level because the Olympics are an international event. Now, I don't know if you guys know what happened about uh, four to six weeks after the torch relay, somebody threw a hand grenade in the clubhouse. Oh, right. Did you suspect that it, possibly came from law enforcement well i'll tell you what i did was i got a phone call that uh, there was an explosion at the uh uh, clubhouse i got down there immediately i mean the place was still full of smoke that's how fast i got down there and 
they had the place all ro- ro- roped off, and the bomb squad was going through other, uh, trying to look at all the vehicles around there. And then the front door of the clubhouse, I saw something that attracted my attention, and it was the spoon of this hand grenade they had thrown in there. So I asked one of the local cops, I said, can you give me the lot number off that spoon? You know, having a military background, I, I knew we could do some investigation uh, and follow out, you know, backtrace and find out where it came from. And I did. I hired an ex-FBI agent investigator, and uh, he traced it. And the hand grenade was missing from an armory in Akron, Ohio, the same place the ATF uh, unit uh, that was guarding the Olympics uh, was based out of. Well, that's sketchy. So, yeah, it's very sketchy. So, you know, do I know for a fact it was the ATF? No. And I don't think there was an official order that came down from anybody. I think it was some rogue guys that uh, thought, you know, this guy thinks he's a smart ass. We're going to teach him a little lesson here. And, you know, they hurt a couple of Hells Angels real bad, especially David Ortega. He was in the hospital several days. And, uh, you know, immediately the cops said he was building a bomb. That's. Uh, you know what the explosion was the cover was story. About. Yeah, that was their cover story. George, and, uh, uh, around around that same time, there was a uh, the murder of a uh, the son of a, a, a pretty powerful gangland figure in L.A. Uh, by the name of Eddie Nash. If anyone's seen the movie Wonderland or, or is familiar with the John Holmes uh, saga, right. Eddie Nash was kind of the mob boss. He was, pal- I believe, he was. Palestinian. Yeah, and he owned the Starwood. Uh, yeah, Nike, yeah he owned the stuff. Yeah. His son ended up dead, I believe, in 1984. Um, I think there was alleged ties to some beef with the Hell's Angels. Is there anything, any light you could shed on that? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't know Eddie Nash. I know that there was inferences that, you know, we somehow had an issue with him. Uh, you know, in 19... 19- 86, I was set up by a member of the Mexican mafia, that that prison gang that uh, pretty much ran the California uh, penal system. La M. A. Yeah, La M. A. And uh, I was good friends with Mike Eisen, who was one of the top uh, echelon guys. And after Mike got arrested, this guy showed up at the clubhouse, and his name was Mike Mulhern. And he was one of the uh, uh, founding guys as well. So you had Joe Morgan, uh, Topo, you had uh, uh, Mike Eisen, Mike Mulhern. Uh, did I mention Joe Morgan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joe yes. Peg, Peg yeah. Leg Joe yeah. Morgan. Peg for Leg people that Morgan. for people don't know, it, it, he's a fascinating figure in the history of American underworld joe morgan was a croatian that grew up in an all hispanic neighborhood in la and eventually rose through the ranks of the mexican mafia to become one of the 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 biggest shot callers uh, in that gang i would say i would say he is the shot caller or was a shot caller he died in prison he died up in pelican bay uh, from cancer and you had a croatian guy that became the godfather of the mexican mafia which is just on its on its uh on its face just uh, riveting yeah, he he used to call. Uh, they would call down from Pelican Bay. I would talk to Mike Eisen, and uh, I would talk to Joe Morgan. They were in the cells next to each other, and these guys never got out of their cells. They actually uh, created a shower unit that would come down the hallway, and they'd unrack the door and they'd step into the shower. They never never get out of their cells, and uh, it was some real rough time for them. And, they, uh, they, you know, Mike, go ahead. I'm interested, you know, kind of on a quick aside when we're talking about the Mexican Mafia and the Hells Angels dealings with them. The Mexican Mafia kind of, uh, not kind of, but they, they really uh, invented the concept of if you control the inside, you can control the outside. <laughs> um, was that something that you were aware of when it was happening? Did you see it kind of uh, evolving? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they taxed every street gang in Southern California. And if you and Joe Morgan came up with the idea, along with, you know, the other guys that eventually all these street gang members are going to wind up in the California penal system. So if they're selling drugs on the street, 
we want a taste of it. And if they don't pay us, as soon as one of their, a guy from whatever street it may be, uh, 22nd Street or whatever, gets rolled up and shows up uh, in the uh, California State Prison, if these people haven't been paying their tax, they would immediately kill them. And uh, they, uh, they just ruled with an iron hand. And that's how they ruled everything. That they, uh, you know, they had a beef with the Mongols because the Mongols started drawing members from the uh, street gangs and the Mexican mafia, uh, you know, had an issue up, uh, about it. And, uh, you know, they wound up going at it for a while. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the Mexican mafia prevailed. Uh, you know, they agreed to the tax that they had created uh, so many years ago. Can you can you walk us back through the so so your the your murder trial and how that connected back to the these Mexican mafia guys? Just if you could finish your well, your thought. Yeah, I'm sorry. This guy, yeah, it's quite this all right. guy, Mike Mulhern, came to me and he said, "You and I have some mutual friends." I didn't know him personally, and I said, "Oh, really? Who, who do we?" Uh, who do we have as friends? And he goes, Mike Eisen. And well, Mike, like I said, was one of the top tier guys. I said, Oh yeah, Mike Eisen and I are good friends. And he said, look, George, I've come to you. I, we got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, uh, there's a guy out in prison in Arizona that owes the Mexican mafia $10,000. He's in federal prison. And we've come to you guys. We figured you'd pay the bill so we don't disrupt our uh, relationship. And, you know, I told him, I said, I'm not paying no $10,000 for this guy. And I knew who the guy was. And he had a history of masquerading as a hell's angel. So it made sense. Well, unbeknownst to me, this guy had been working, and unbeknownst to the Mexican mafia, this guy had been working with the feds for almost a decade. And uh, he was recording everything we were saying. And, uh, you know, he basically got me on tapes. You know, he said, look, if you don't pay the $10,000, we're going to kill him. You got a problem with that? And I said, no. And uh, I got uh, a murder for hire uh, conspiracy beef over that. I was looking at life on one count, 20 on the other. And they tried to present it to the jury that this guy was dead. And, uh, you know, he actually was in the witness protection program. Mike Mulhern was in the witness protection program and the target guy was in the witness protection program as well. They actually staged a murder at the prison and uh, closed the yard down, wheeled him out of there on a gurney and put him in an ambulance and drove him out. I mean, everybody thought he was dead because they were trying to get me in some more incriminating conversations. And they came back to me and said, well, you know, we killed the guy. You know, I said, well, none of my business, uh, that's your business. And, uh, they didn't have that recording. <laughs> the tape recorder didn't work that day. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting. So at this point, George, I mean, the feds consider him and, and local, uh, the cops, consider him a public enemy. And, and George and I have talked about something that I, I think is an interesting position he has, which is, look, if I if you catch me doing something, then I'll do my time and take my medicine. But But don't manufacture evidence against me such a thin line sometimes people don't realize the thin line between the good guys and the bad right, guys. right right if you could comment on that george well you know it's interesting as you said during our conversation a few days ago you know i've been in prison three times all for things i had nothing to do with the things i did do you know they never even came close <laughs> and you know I guess uh, maybe at the end of the day, it balances out. I don't know if that's really fair. And like I told you, my last case in 2011, the case went on for three years. And in 2013, uh, you know, we were fighting it out, picking the jury. Uh, my daughter was uh, one of my criminal lawyers. My oldest daughter's uh, also my criminal lawyer. And uh, finally, the judge had had enough Judge Wu. And he looked at the U.S. attorney and he said, look, this case isn't what you want it to be. You want this to build your career, but it's not there. He goes, you got this guy looking at three life sentences and you got no evidence. And I, I was feeling uh, uh, pretty powerful at the time. I thought, gee, he's going to dis dismiss from the bench a direct dismissal. And, uh, and then he looked at me and he said, and you, Mr. Christie, God only knows what you've gotten away with the last 40 years. 
Uh, and he made us go down uh, to Judge Walter's uh, uh, courtroom and hammer out some sort of deal. And, you know, I wound up uh, getting three years. I had two years uh, time served, and I went to Texas for a year. But there's a perfect example of not having anything to do with this particular crime. You know, even in the police uh, and the FBI reports, the FBI 302 they said, did Mr. Christie tell you to firebomb the tattoo shops? And uh, no, he didn't. But I knew what Mr. Christie was thinking. It's right in the 302. I mean, it's just amazing. That, so he can uh, read minds. You know, they can <laughs> read really... minds. We, they knew what I was thinking. Well, I'll tell you, the philosophy <laughs> from the federal government is that the ends justify the means. <laughs> and now. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that's up for debate whether or not that, that holds water. But right. I know from talking to a lot of these guys, when they'll kind of wink, wink and admit that they uh, s- s- stretch the law sometimes and, and, and kind of s- step over those boundaries, then that's, that's their, their normal retort. Let, let me interject something here. You know, it, it was, you know, you hear people talking about, you know, cops and the feds and sometimes they make uh, disparaging remarks uh, you know they're stupid and they're this and they're that you know these guys are professionals they do this every day and some of these guys are very very good at it and i'll tell you here's a perfect perfect example i wound up getting fed up with the club and in 2011 i walked into the meeting and i basically uh, uh told everybody how I was feeling about things and the direction we were going as an organization. And I said, I've had enough. I gave you 40 years. I don't want to do this anymore. And I took my patch off and put it on the table. Uh, you know, didn't go over well, but I, you know, I walked out of there within two weeks, the feds indicted me, you know, uh, three weeks. I don't know what it was. Uh, uh, and said, there's a murder contract on you by the club. Uh, you got nobody to go uh, to, but us, George. And, you know, they figured they could flip me and uh there's no way i wanted to live the rest of my life in seclusion or hiding you know i had been uh uh, living free and speaking my mind for years and uh you know i told him i said look i'll take my chances in the courtroom and uh you know my daughter and i and another lawyer named mike mayock uh you know we put a defense together but you know you talk about opportunists, there was an opportunity for these guys to make a move. You know, they made a calculated uh, call that, you know, maybe this guy will uh, flip. uh, And, you know, they were offering everything, you know. Uh, They said, look, you got 50 years worth of uh, information. Uh, You can take the whole house down. You know, what do you want? You know, I said, I want to go to trial. That's what I want. But uh, it's uh, when you become a target, you pretty much stay a target uh, uh, till they get what they want. You know, they said they'd catch up with me when I beat them in 1986, 87. When I walked out of the courtroom, they said, "Oh, we'll see you down the road, George." That's mm-hmm. their exact words, and it took them 30 years to do it, but they kept their word uh, and they did it. And you know, they passed that vendetta on to the younger agents uh, as they came on board, and the older guys retired. You know, I outlasted I think seven presidents. You know, my political tenure in the Hells Angels was, you know, uh, through seven presidents, starting with, yeah. uh, I think, Ford, you know. George, can you? Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say, speaking along these lines of manufacturing evidence, a really interesting situation happened where George did happen to know and be friendly with some some heavyweights in the Italian mafia. And because of that, the state started to connect dots that weren't there, right? So if you could talk to us yeah. about how they how they extrapolated from your friendship with some with some wise guys, and then and then uh, created this notion that see this is the evidence we have of this nexus between the motorcycle clubs and the Italians, and they're all in it together. And if you could talk to us about evil. that, yeah. Well, you know it's it's interesting how they make these quantum leaps now. When I went down uh, to Terminal Island, the federal uh, prison, you know, now they have the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown L.A. But back in the 80s, when you got indicted, you went to Terminal Island. Uh, uh, it was uh, there were like five levels in there because it, it was a like receiving uh, 
center. So you never knew who was going to show up there. It was a medical center as well. So I'm down there and, you know, I get introduced to these guys from uh, New York, you know, uh, Rosario Gambino. He's doing 41 years uh, for the Pizza Connection. Uh, Michael uh, Francesi's down there. He just stole uh, allegedly $10 million in gas tax money from New York. And then you've got the uh, Sam Sarantino, uh, the L.A. boss down there. Him and Carlos Marcello got involved uh, trying to bribe a judge. Uh, so, you, you know, you had all these underworld heavyweights there. And then, you know, plus you had a lot of soldiers and whatnot in there. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was the first guy to ever get blackballed. He was putting a black book in Vegas. Uh, he was doing time there uh, for throwing acid in somebody's face that wouldn't pay him uh, You know who that is, John? Money. Do you remember who that was? Johnny Deal? Oh, was it I don't Jonathan? know. I don't, yeah, remember, I don't remember either. Name. Okay. Well, anyhow, sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, George. Anyways, nevertheless, so, you know, I, I created this relationship uh, uh, with these guys from New York, and, you know, I'm fighting my case, and Sal, you know, uh, Rosario, I called him Sal, and I became very good friends. We worked uh, in the kitchen together, and he, he made a mean pasta. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so when I got out, he had given me all these numbers in New York to these social clubs. When you go to New York, you know, tell them you're my buddy and this and that. And, you know, it was kind of a, a just a coincidence that I met these guys in the interim, as I'm getting ready to defend myself, this 1986 case, I wind up using a lawyer named Alan Kaplan. Who's a really good Rico attorney. He did the pizza connection. He did the stardust skimming uh, case and uh, from the movie casino was made from. And when I come home, they start putting everything together. My house gets raided. And this will tell you how long ago this was, as I mentioned to you when we initially talked this, they take my Rolodex and in my Rolodex are all these, mob guys numbers that Rosario gave me for me to stay in contact with or if I show up in any particular town they'll show me a good time so they call the newspapers up and they say you know we raided George's house we didn't find anything but we found something very interesting in his Rolodex are these numbers to all these known mob figures made guys social clubs uh, so the newspapers call me and uh they said, so how do you explain uh, all these numbers in your Rolodex? And my answer to them was, well, you know, Mickey Rourke's number and Sean Penn's number was also in my Rolodex, but that doesn't make me an actor. <laughs> right, and, uh, the right. cops were so mad because they, they put that in the uh, uh, newspapers. But shortly after that... Can I, can I ask of, you about that, though, really quick? Like, what was your... I know Mickey Rourke and a lot of these guys like to hang out with Tough Hells guys. Angels guys. I know you know Chuck Zito was close with a lot of these guys, Mickey Rourke right. and whatnot. I mean, right. um, did you was that a respectful or mutual respect thing or? Well, you know, Mickey and I became very good friends, and Mickey actually came to my trial. He would come and sit in the front row and piss <laughs> off the U.S. attorneys and the feds because the jury was, uh, uh, you know. Really excited. This one, Mickey was at the top of his game. You know, they were really excited to see him in the trial. And, uh, you know, we were using everything we could because the tapes were so damning uh, against me. But I, I think that, you know, a lot of these guys, uh, you know, they like to come around. They like the excitement uh, of that lifestyle. And, you know, they emulate a lot of these guys uh, on the screen. And I think to hang out with, uh, you know, Mickey hung out with the Hells Angels. Uh, he hung out with uh, a lot of guys out of New York. Uh, I know he went to Gotti's trials. Uh, you know, so he, he kind of liked that lifestyle. But getting back to this, right? because Alan Kaplan initially was my lawyer on this case, we had to take Alan off the case because we had given him a motorcycle as a gift, and he got in a wreck and hurt himself real bad. He had his foot amputated. So Barry Tarlow took over for him as uh, my defense attorney. And uh, because he had 
done these skimming cases and helped Teamsters, they thought somehow, along with these numbers, they made a quantum leap, all these numbers in my Rolodex, that I had a connection to organized crime. And my father and mother, my dad's name was George Gus Christie Sr. I'm George Gus Christie Jr. My father and mother used to go to Vegas all the time, every six weeks, and gamble. And these guys started investigating me uh, so heavy that there was actually reports from the Ventura County District Attorney that I was going to Vegas. George Christie was going to Vegas. He was staying at one of the old mob hotels and picking his skim money up every four to six weeks. And this was actually uh, uh, in one of the reports. And they, these guys believed this. And I became friends with uh, someone in the, uh, one of the five families out of New York. I became very good friends with him, all by coincidence. Uh, he wanted a good lawyer for his brother. And he asked me if I would meet him. And I met him. And him and I hit it off. And we became very good friends. And we'd visit each other. And uh, I'd go to New York and hang out with him. And he'd come to Ventura and hang out. And the, they had video of us hanging out together, pictures of us, and uh, which they felt solidified this rumor that I was picking up skim money out of these hotels out of Vegas. I mean, it was just just a, a ludicrous quantum leap. I mean, there was nothing based in foundation of evidence. It was just, just concepts that these guys had. They went so far as the Ventura District Attorney's Office sent two District Attorney investigators to Robert Blakey. Who you guys remember who Robert? Yeah, uh, JFK, right? Big. Um, uh, well, also the. Uh, oh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Yeah. How long did I get pulled out? Uh, but, I mean, like a second. I think it was. Oh, okay. I think it was all right there. Okay. okay. Uh, you remember who Robert Blake? Yeah. Was? Right. Um, the if, very instrumental in. Uh, didn't he work for RFK and investigated yeah. the JFK assassination? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. They actually sent two of them. Ventura District Attorney investigators to Robert Blakey to get his opinion if there was a possibility I was somehow tied in to these uh, crime figures and I was getting skim money. Just, what, what just, did Blake? Uh, what did Blakey? How did he? What was his? Uh, the, well, what his, you know, he said, "Well, you know, where's your evidence?" <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. I mean, he, he, I actually called him after my uh, 2001, 2002 case. And he was really aghast to talk to. Unfortunately, I guess he's approached by so many law enforcement uh, personnel, he didn't even remember. Oh. Unless, unless he was just being elusive to me. You know, he said, you know, I, George, I really don't remember them coming here. But, uh, you know, I explained the situation to him, and he said, well, what did I say? And I, I, said, I told him what he <laughs> said, and he laughed. And uh, I, I believe he was instrumental in crafting the rico statute absolutely as, as well yeah, yeah he he helped uh, draft that law which uh you know they used that on us in 1979 up in san francisco uh, judge conti and you know who the prosecutor was on that uh 1979 racketeering case in san francisco was right uh no remind me robert Mueller. Oh, yes, right. Of course. Coming full yeah. circle. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, Robert Mueller, you know. Right, and, right. You know, they didn't get a, uh, uh, they got a hung jury, and uh, they just didn't want to spend any more money. They'd spent so much money, and the, the jury just didn't buy. No, that was, the, uh, that was a big deal in the criminal justice system, because that was, you know, the feds were hot to prove that the, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club was the equivalent of the Italian Mafia just on motorcycles. And when that case failed, that was um, they had to go back to the drawing board and, and re, re, rethink the way they were approaching um, going after the, the um, motorcycle clubs. You're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, they, you know, they referred to us as the number two criminal organization in the United States, uh, you know, second to the Mafia. And uh, they called us, uh, you know, the mafia on two wheels is how they described us. And uh, it, ju it just didn't fly in the courtroom. And you're absolutely correct. They went back 
to the drawing board, and they came back with Operation Rough Rider in 1984, and they uh, they came after individual members. And, uh, you know, my position on that whole thing was I went back to some of the trials in New York in the federal building there, and what they basically did was they took low-level drug dealers and gave them an opportunity for money and larger amounts of drugs. They were supplying the money and they were supplying the drugs. Uh, you know, so what they would did is they took low level drug dealers who were basically selling drugs to, you know, party with and uh, maybe to supplement, you know, their income somewhat. I mean, not a lot of dough. And they turned them into, uh, you know, higher level uh, drug dealers with government money. Wow. And, uh, I didn't know about you know, that, that, those cases. Yeah. Operation Rough Rider. That's, it, it, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, they uh, uh, actually gave a uh, – there was a member that they tried to get on the, the racketeering trial in 79 named Big Albert Perryman. And uh, uh, Big Al uh, was just like a larger-in-life figure. And during that racketeering case with Mueller, he had been writing his girlfriend and telling her – you got to wait for me, honey. Uh, I'm going to be home in a couple of years. I got millions of dollars hidden. I got diamonds. I got rubies. <laughs> wow. And he's writing home, and the prison guys are intercepting, opening the mail up, you know, copying it, and then turning it over to the feds. And it was interesting. When we pulled the jury after the, you know, the jury hung, we pulled the jury, and there was only one person they believed during the whole trial. They didn't believe any of the feds. They didn't believe any of the uh, our witnesses. They didn't believe any of the U.S. attorneys, and they didn't believe any of the Hells Angels defense attorneys. The only person they believed was Albert Perryman. Albert gets up on the stand, and uh, he's a real jivey kind of a guy. You know, always <laughs> wears a stingy broom hat and had it walked with a cane. <laughs> always looking stylish and uh so he gets up on the stand takes a stand and the u.s attorney shows him the letters he goes he goes isn't it true you said you had this and isn't it true you said that and he looked at the jury and he goes of course i did he goes i was in prison he goes how in the hell was she gonna wait for me if i didn't lie to her <laughs> that's great that's yeah, great and the, and the jury the jury said that was the only guy they believed you know, wow. I think his exact words were, obviously, you've never been to prison. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I just was. I just Googled um, some images of him, and there's a there's a photo here of him uh, dressed like basically Al Capone with the pinstripes and the, oh, and the yeah. hat. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the character. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, it's, it's funny. I do lectures sometimes, and I'll show a picture of Albert, and uh, I'll go, you know, here's a famous Hells Angel. You know, he was uh, uh, knifed, and uh, he was shot. Uh, and he did it all to himself. <laughs> he shot himself uh, oh, man. Uh, once, and uh, he went to put his knife back in the scabbard another time, and it went right through his stomach. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. He, he, was, he was quite a character. I mean, this guy would get on the dance floor, and he'd have four or five of the most beautiful women dancing around him. He oh, man. <laughs> he, was, uh, uh, he was your all-time uh, Hells Angel great. Is he going to be a um, – well, maybe this is a, a good segue to talk about what you're up to now. I mean, uh, George is a prolific media personality here, author, also has some TV projects in the works, some TV projects that have already been accomplished. And I know you have something in the works right now. I'm not sure how much you want to talk about it, but I'm wondering if, if maybe Big Al is going to be a character in, in, in your latest project. But I, I'm not sure how much you want to talk about that yet. Well, you know I – I'm in the middle of uh, getting ready to go to Pinewood Studio in London, and uh, they're building a soundstage there, and uh, they're building a, uh, a street in uh, the movie studio in Spain. We'll be going back and forth between the two uh, locations. They're replicating Ventura, California, and Ojai, California, uh, in these studios. And uh, I wrote a book called Mart, and it's a fictionalized account of the early days uh, in the outlaw bike world. And uh, it's a fictionalized account of my life. 
And uh, instead of calling uh, the club the Hells Angels, I call them the question marks. And after I uh, did the Outlaw Chronicles on the History Channel, several high-power people in the uh, industry saw it and saw how it became the surprise hit for the uh, uh, History Channel. It's great, it's great world, documentary. Like, great documentary yeah, series, by the way. It showed like five times around the world. I mean, it's just always gets great. Uh, it's compelling. You know, we were pulling in two million uh, viewers every time it showed. Yeah. So these guys saw that, and uh, they got a hold of my books, and they asked me if I would be willing to take marked and update it to more of an Afghanistan, Iraq uh, time frame, because it kind of starts out during the Vietnam era in uh, the original uh, version. And I said, yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, I signed a deal. It's going to probably be a TV series uh I'm not sure when it's going to uh, debut. It's probably end of this year or first of next year. But I'm looking forward to leaving for uh, London and then Spain. Uh, I'm going to write the pilot with some other writers. And I'm actually going to play Old Man John uh, in the uh, series. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't, I, you didn't mention that. And so, yeah. And, and he's, yeah. the idea will be he'll, he'll have some connection to the Chicago Wise Guys. For, is that the, one the of the storylines? Old Man lines? John. Uh, is going to have uh, uh, the business of the marked uh, motorcycle club in Ventura County is going to be gambling. And uh, if you look at some of the old uh, clips, I should send them to you. I got some clips from the mid eighties and they're raiding all the clubhouses in Southern California because they say we're running an illegal gambling operation. Mm. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, they never proved it, but, you know, they made accusations. You know what pull tabs are? Uh, no. They're, they're kind of like, uh, you, you, you can purchase them like at a party. If you're having a party, you can purchase these pull tabs and you pull the tabs off and then it's like a, a slot machine. Oh, there are okay. a lot of, a lot of bars nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. I got and you. And then you look and see what you got and, you know, they pay off, you know, a few hundred dollars. Right. Uh, so, uh, they found a bunch of those pull tabs, uh, Hell's Angel clubhouses in Ventura area. Uh, and they, you know, they said we also had, uh, you know, we were running numbers and mm. illegal gambling and, and whatnot. They never proved anything, but we're going to take that and use it, uh, in the series. Uh, old man, John's going to be friends with, uh, Tony Accardo type character oh, out of wow. Chicago. Yeah. You know, Tony Accardo retired in Palm Springs. Oh, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize that in California. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so he retired in California, and, like, in the series, Old Man John will be going out to uh, uh, this Tony Accardo character, and, you know, uh, when the when the younger guy, Jack Crest, gets in the club, uh, Old Man John's going to teach him... Uh, how to do all this stuff. Uh, so uh, it's going to all be part of the series. Have you, have you cast, have they cast that, that character yet? That's going to be the character well, based on you somewhat, in my understanding. Well, yeah, uh, they were talking about some people and I, I can't say, okay. You know, I, I like understand. The, the, sure. the streaming company is huge. They got 40 million subscribers so you can figure out <laughs> okay. who it is. You know? uh, <laughs> I like they that. just don't, they want to control. They want to control all the PR. Sure, I understand. And, uh, yeah, so that I'm, I've signed an NDA. I can't, I can't tell you uh, who it is, but it's. And you know what? Once this thing uh, breaks, uh, and you guys, if you see it, uh, maybe we'll do this again. Sometime yeah, no, fantastic! You just read my mind. Yeah, we have yeah, to have you I, back. I'd love to talk about uh, how the whole thing came down because there's some real high power people in the entertainment business that uh, really love the Outlaw Chronicles, and one of their concerns was. We know this guy, Christy, can deliver uh, on the screen, but can we control this son of a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> They're about to find out, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and, how uh, and and so how? Where can our audience find out more about you? You you have a website or something you'd like to share yeah, with us? Yeah, georgechristy dot com, or you can go to Instagram, George Christy Junior. Uh, but uh, if you go to georgechristy dot com, it'll take you right to my Instagram uh, stuff and. The new, there's a big story. I got the cover of a magazine this week. Uh, just came out today, 
and there's a uh, story. I think I sent that story to you. Yeah, yes, I? I read it. Yeah, yeah. Great. There's a, that that story. That story is on my website. It has a lot of information and, uh, about the new show, the the forthcoming yes. show. Yeah, and you know, I've I've, I've got uh, you know my book Exile on Front Street and my book Marked, and I'm halfway through the second volume of Marked. Uh, it's called Marked Up. And uh, I'm going to stick to the uh, to the original book uh, format. Uh, and what's going to happen is, uh, you know, Jack Crest has established himself in the outlaw bike world. He's kind of taken over uh, as leader of this fictitious club. And uh, now uh, the fun's going to start for him. He's going to wind up in a, you know, underground war. And, you oh, know, wow. Kind of follows my whole lifestyle. Yeah, so that's fantastic. So make sure, uh, please uh, visit his website, buy his books, check out his TV shows. I, I believe you can purchase an autographed book as well from your site. Is you that can. Correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, there's autograph books, and I can't keep up with these guys. All the stuff they're doing, <laughs> and I think it's going to get, you know, it's going to get wilder uh, as the show gets closer. You know. Well, we're gonna. Uh, we have to wrap up here, uh, George. Um, we we greatly appreciate your time. Um, fascinating story. We look forward to all your different projects, and uh, thanks for visiting the OG podcast. I have had a blast, you guys. I really appreciate it. I hope we can do it again.